Good. Good. Fine. So, should, should we start? No, I, I want to yeah, wait. Okay, no, there's no hurry. I, I want to wait until the, the clock okay. says 5.02. <laughs> then I think so. All right, let's begin. Uh, um, Hello, everybody. For some, most of you, it's good evening. For some of you, it's good morning. But in any event, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, today's speaker. Hello to everyone. Hello. Hi, Igor. So um, it is uh, 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 before I hand the, the microphone to uh, to Paul. Uh, uh, let me say especially for those of you who may be joining for the first time, yeah. that uh, uh, during the talk, when Paul starts speaking, please put yourself on mute. So in the bottom left corner of everybody's Zoom's menu, uh, there should be a mute button. Uh, so put yourself on mute. And when and if you want to ask a question, then unmute yourself and ask the question. So that's sort of how we'll try to proceed. So with that said, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker in the New York Group Series Seminar. Uh, it's Paul Soup, uh, my old friend and colleague from the University of Illinois. And he's going to talk about course computability and the house of distance between Turing degrees. And, um, what, and we'll explain how this has to do with geometric group theory. Well, well it done. so indeed, I'm going to talk about course computability and the house of distance between Turing degrees. Uh, well, much of the, this is very much joint work with Carl Jakush. Well, I hope he will correct me if I make any mistakes. Yes, if you have questions, please do ask. So, because uh, this might, material might not be familiar to many people. So, computability theory in, in general studies Turing degrees. So, that's just subsets of natural numbers under computational equivalence. And course computability studies how well arbitrary sets can be approximated by computable sets. So, the main idea of this talk is I don't, we're putting the study of Turing degrees into a metric space S, which is rather strange, but it has some very interesting properties. And it turns out this leads to a natural definition of the Hausdorff distance between Turing degrees. So the first talk of the, part of the talk mainly considers properties of S, and we'll then consider the, how they relate, these properties relate to computability. It turns out that asymptotic density is completely intrinsic to computability computability theory. So we first need to discuss asymptotic density. Since we're considering subsets of the natural numbers, in this context with this, this classical asymptotic density from number theory, so for a subset of n, you for n at least one, you, you define the density of a at n as the number of elements in a, which are less than n, divided by n. And the asymptotic density Rho of A is the limit as N goes to infinity of these rho, if this limit exists. Of course, in general, this limit doesn't exist at all. But while, while it, the, the whole limit doesn't exist, the upper, the upper density, which is a limb soup, and the lower density, which is a limb inf, always exists. And these, are, these are limits of bounded monotonic sequences. And these uh, are densities we will mainly use. Okay, an easy lemma, which but is implicitly used many, many times here. The lower density of a set is one minus the upper density of its complement. I'm writing not A for complement since we're going to use bars for closures later. So, of course, at any particular finite n, the density of A is one minus the, one minus the density of its complement. And you just take the limb in for both sides of the ends and you get you get this le uh, the lemma. So the symmetric difference uh, of two sets, of course, is a subset of n where they disagree. And I'm writing that a of n, the set of n where a of n is not equal to b of n. A of a or something and then with a parentheses n is, is a characteristic function of the set. Now there doesn't seem to be a standard notation for the cut for a complement of a of the symmetric difference, which is a set where they do, the set of n where they do agree. So this is a symmetric agreement of a and b. And we find it very useful to use triangle down to denote the uh, symmetric agreement. 
Now, we can now define when for us two sets are essentially the same. So given A and B, uh, two sets A and B are coarsely similar if their symmetric di difference has density zero. So they agree except on a set of density zero. This is equivalent to their symmetric agreement having density one. And given A and E set B, such that B is coarsely similar to A, is called the coarse description of A. So it's very easy to check, of course, that coarse similarity is an equivalence relation on subsets of N. And so uh, script S is, is the power set of N modulo this equivalence relation. So the so a, a definition, a set is coarsely computable if it's coarsely similar to a computable set. That is, it has a computable coarse description. One way of thinking of coarse computability is the following. The set A is coarsely computable. We have a total algorithm phi. Now we, we're requiring this algorithm be total. So it may, may be mistakes on membership in A, but mistakes only on a negligible set. So it's all, phi always answers and is almost always correct. So note in particular, all sets of density one and all sets of density zero are coarsely computable by the two constant algorithms. So once you consider core, uh, coarse computability, this, this equivalence relation, uh, well, is, is inherent. Now there's a natural pseudometric on collection of subsets of N you find that the distance delta AB to be the upper density of their symmetric difference. Check a Venn diagram argument shows that delta satisfies the triangle inequality and certainly is a pseudometric on subsets of N. And since delta of AB is zero, yeah, exactly when they're coarsely similar. This is actually a metric on the space of coarse similarity classes. So the metric space in which we're going to work is this space S with delta as the metric. Now, I'm sure this metric has been discovered many, many times. Uh, I would imagine this was certainly, certainly Kuratowski, Sierpinski, but I remember the Polish school considered this sometime. It has recently been used on subsets of Z to study cellular automata's dynamical systems. Uh, for some reason, the automata theory literature attributes this metric to Besikovic and Sykes's book on almost periodic functions as a, as a reference. Uh, this seems strange to me since the notion of relative density uh, on the real use in studying almost periodic functions. Actually, I learned about this by going through Besikovic's book to see if there's uh, if any of them in there. But in his book, it may be in some, somewhere else, but in his book, he certainly doesn't, Besikovic doesn't consider arbitrary subsets of N or any metric on them uh, or anything like that. So as I say, I, I would suppose this metric was, someone thought about it in the 20s. Now, of course, also the sub, subsets of N form an abelian group of exponent two by defining A plus B as the symmetric difference. Now, this is usually a just a curiosity. I mean, what would we do with it? But in our case, since it's, it's well-defined on similarity classes, and it's certainly continuous in the metric, because the metric is measured is upper density of symmetric difference. So S is a topological group by defining A plus B as a class of A, the symmetric difference of A and B. Now, the important property for us is the following. If you take a subset T, and you define the, tra or the translation map from S to S by adding, adding T, or adding class T, the, the thing in classes. Uh, but since plus is the same thing as delta, the immediate equation A plus T plus B plus T is A plus B, this is the same thing as A plus T symmetric difference B plus T is symmetric difference of A and B. The point is the translation by T is an isometry. And actually, we really need this. So S acts on itself by isometries, and the space is completely homogeneous. OK. So some properties. Now we'll start looking at some properties of S. Uh, this space is very non-separable. 
The following, uh, here's fo following sets are, are really basic to studying course computability. We'll see, actually see why they're basic to course computability later, but IN is the half open interval from N factorial to N plus one factorial. As a subset of N, of course. And the theorem is you take any countable subset of S, there's some, there's some, there's a point B such that the distance from B to AI is one for all, for all I. And here's the proof. I'm going to sketch the proof of, of several things to, uh, to show what's involved. But th this is actually the whole proof. If you take the pairing function from n cross n to n, denoted by bracket i m, you define, just define b as follows. If n is, uh, codes the pair i m, you make b agree with the complement of a i on i m. So at rho of n plus plus one factorial, the symmetric agreement uh, There was this one symmetric agreement there, I guess. The symmetric agreement of, of this of B and AI is less than one over n plus one. But because they have a pairing function, you're hitting this on infinitely many intervals. So the, the lower so the lower density is symmetric agreement is zero. So that's one minus the upper density, and that is exactly the distance. So a couple of corollaries of this. First of all, of course, there's an uncountable subset U said so all members of U are pairwise at distance one from each other. Any questions so far? Uh, Paul, you, you, uh, can you go back? I mean, this, this is just a diagonalization argument. Why did you take the pairing? Oh. Why, why is the pair, why is the pairing? Like uh, you want to disagree with the nth set on the nth interval, right? Yeah, and, and it's, you take a pairing because this happens on infinitely many intervals, which are getting bigger and bigger. Oh, you want, I see. So you want each, so basically you enumerate the sets so that they, each of them appear infinitely yeah, it's, often? Yeah, this is n, n is, n is coding the pair I am. Okay, gotcha, so gotcha, I B is, 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 is uh, agrees with the capital on inf infinitely many of these huge intervals. Right, you want to disagree on a non-measure uh, zero set, I get it, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a set of... Positive density, or no. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We, we, you wanted to really to disagree on a set of... Uh, uh, yeah, to, to agree on a set of density zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we have that, we just take the... Here's a Zorin's lemma argument. We just take all subsets of S with the property that all members are, are pairwise at distance one. Union of ascending chain of such sets has the same property. Zorn's lemma is a maximal element, and U has to be uncountable by the by the, the just the previous statement. Another corollary, of course, is S is very non-compact. Open covers don't even have to have countable subcovers, so it's not Lindelof. And just take any cover by open balls, all of whose radii are less than one. You have a countable subset. There's a point P at distance one from all the centers of the of these BI, so this point P is not in the union. So these are some quote uh, bad properties. Now onto the good properties. So this space S, of course, similarity classes is complete. So here's another family of sets that arise in studying course computability. JK is the half open interval from two to the K minus one to two to the K plus one minus one. The, these sets are around, in, in course computability, we're stretching one bit of information over very large intervals many times. So the idea of the proof, if, you have, if we have a Cauchy sequence in S, of course, we pass to a substance, subsequence, we can assume, assume that the distance between CM and CN is less than two over, one order of two to the M if, if N is bigger than M. And just take the set C, such for every case, C and CK agree on this interval JK. 
Okay, so it's green with lo long, larger, lo larger intervals, with seas that are further out, and then this, so the CIs converge to C. Of course, one really has to check the epsilons, but uh, it's clear that that should really work. So also the space is pathwise connect connected. Indeed, it's contractible. So consider how we make a path from the empty set to the, to the natural numbers. It's, so we partition n into consecutive intervals l1 and l2, etc. The length of li is i. So we take the lengths are increasing, and they, they're, the l's contain everything. Given r in the unit interval, you define cr such that for every i, cr intersect li is the longest initial segment whose density just within this uh, set li does not exceed r. So we take the right fraction of things in each interval. And then we can check that CR, if CR has density R, they're, they're properly nested. CS is in CR if and only if S is in R. And the distance between them, which is the upper density of CR, of the symmetric difference in CR and CS is just R minus S. So we define a path from the unit interval to S by P of R as CR. This preserves the metric, it's continuous. And it has the right values at the right values at the endpoints. So that's a path. Uh, part of the point of this construction, oh, oh, now for an arbitrary A, yeah. You just let AR equal A intersect CR, where C, CR are these this family of uniform uh, family of sets. And to obtain a path from the empty set to A, you just find P sub A, this by P of A of R is AR. And it's easy to check that, <coughs> oh, yeah, by definition again, they, the path goes to the right places. It's continuous because the different, yeah, the distance between P of, P of R and P of S is less than that, equal to the absolute value of R minus S. And of course, to, to get a, a path between arbitrary classes, we just take a path from A, plus b to the empty set and translate by b and you get a path from a to b. The point of these c's, another point of these c's is that this is a uniform construction. So define capital free from s cross the inter unit interval to s by phi of a r is equal class a r. And this again, this, this has all the right values and to check that it's continuous, it's continuous in both variables, you just note that the symmetric difference of AR and B sub S is contained in the symmetric difference of A and B and union the symmetric difference of CR and CS. So if both of these are small, then the left-hand side is small. So it's continuous. Okay, that's a, so that's a contraction. Now, in general, the uniform, these uniform paths don't have to be geodesics, but we can get obtain geodesics by refining this construction. And the theorem is that S delta is actually a geometric, a geodesic metric space, the kind of space that we like. And the idea is, that as before, we wanted to want a geodesic pass from the empty set to an arbitrary point. Just relativize the previous construction. Use if you using the set A is the parameter. So if A, we're supposing, of course, that A is not the empty, it's not similar, coarsely similar to phi. So in particular, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an infinite set. So we can let L0, LA, one of A, et cetera, partition A into this joint intervals where the, whether there, where there are N elements of A in LN's upper A, and we just define AS to be the, the same construct, A upper S to be the first floor of SN elements of each uh, LN of A. Again, beta, beta from the unit interval to S uh, defined by beta of small s is capital A S. It's a geodesic. Now, for a geodesic between arbitrary classes, we just take this path beta and translate it. 
this is where we really we really actually need to need the fact that translation is an isometry. Now there's there's some strange properties of these geodesics though. So in computability theory, Lebesgue, Lebesgue measure on the unit interval is often applied by re, you regard an infinite set A as corresponding to the is the number b0, b1, blah, 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 defined by the binary expansion whose nth digit b sub n is characteristic function of a at, at n. So it's either 0 or 1, depending whether, whether or not n is in a. And if we see, let's fix an arbitrary set a. Strong law of large numbers says that we take this collection of sets m such that the distance from b to a is a half, which is the same as the distance from b to the complement of a. This, uh, this has measure one in, uh, on subsets of n. So in particular, it follows the complement of n, had, since the complement of m has measure zero, any coarse similarity class must have measure zero. We're going to use this. So let's get a proof that for if we take A, any class A at any point A and S, there are uncountably many distinct geodesics between A and its complement. As I say, I think of this as a weird sphere. So uh, of course, on the, no on the normal two sphere, if you take two antipodal points, there are uncountably many geodesics. So this is so A and not its complement are antipodal points. So this is not so surprising. Uh, Distance between A and its complement is certainly one. We just take M as we did before. We take all sets such that uh, distance from B to A is a distance from B to its complement, which is a half. So that has measure one. I take C to be the set of classes, similarity classes such of elements B, B, which are in M. Now claim that this, uh, this set, this C has to be un uncountable. Because there were only countably many classes in C, since a similarity class has measure zero, M would have measure zero by additivity of Lebesgue measure, but has measure one. So for each C, we use the previous theorem to construct a geodesic path from A to C, a geodesic path from C to A to the complement A. C is a midpoint. We combine these two paths to get a geodesic from A to its complement. But if C is, the class of C is not equal to D, then they, the midpoints are different. So then we have uncountably many choices for the midpoints. So there have to be uncountably many distinct uh, geodesics from A to its complement. So if you think of those in Tibble points, that's not, that's not so surprising, but it's more complicated. But this, this stra very strange sphere has the property that given any two distinct points, there are uncountably many geodesics from from one to the other. So this is mainly, we're mainly finished with the properties of S. This is, uh, there's only one property of S left which, will, left, which we'll get to later. So we need to, uh, yeah. so let's see how some of this relates to computability theory. So, We'll start with discussing Oracle Turing machines. Now, Turing formalized the notion of being computable is computable by a Turing machine. So in modern terms, this is just an idealized digital computer. Uh, I assure you that in computable, improving theorems, computability theorists do not worry about, about the, the details of the hardware at all. And many of the con basic concepts of computability theory are, are, very, are very straightforward. Now, since a Turing machine is completely defined by its finite program, so there are only countably many Turing machines. So, of course, most sets are not computable. But it's still the case that some sets are more complicated than others. Now, in thinking about mathematics, we often think of in terms of relative computability. They don't know how to compute A, but if I could compute B, then I could compute A. Well, Turing himself defined, it turns out Turing himself defined Oracle Turing machines in his Princeton thesis. 
but he did not make any use whatsoever of them. His Princeton thesis about logic of logics of ordinals. Uh, this was a, this was an offhand remark. It was Emil Post who realized that formalizing relative computability in terms of or Oracle Turing machines give the basis for a general theory of computability. Since this is a New York seminar, we should mention it. Post was at Post was at City College, and Post is one of the real, real founders of computability theory as a general enterprise. This is his fa this is only his famous 1944 paper. So an Oracle Turing machine is just like an ordinary Turing machine, uh, except as is. If you're thinking of Turing machine term tapes and a query tape, it has a random access memory, the Oracle, which contains the characteristic function of set. So it's an ordinary digital computer with a special hardware slot. So when you plug in, plug into the C, plug a slip, a, a chip into this slot, which it contains a characteristic function of a subset of N. So the program, there are only, of course, Turing machines are the ultimate in, uh, reduced instruction set architecture. So there's only one kind of instruction. Machines with Oracle, there are two types of instruction. There's also a branch instruction. And a branch instruction, the number on the query tape is in the Oracle set, or if you think of it as a special register, it go, the machine goes to one state. If not, it goes to one, a different state. It goes to one instruction. If not, it goes to another instruction. So, yeah, note that the and an Oracle Turing is still completely defined by its by a finite program. So the branch instruction doesn't get doesn't it doesn't pays no it, it just says if the if this number is in the Oracle does one thing if not it's other. So it's either do this or do that. Uh, of course, what the, what the machine actually computes depends on what the Oracle is. Of course, because because it's using it's using that information. Is it clear? Is that point clear? Yes. Okay. So again, the point, there's an effective list of, there's an effective list of all Oracle Turing machines, period. Actually, actually just from this point, one can do computability theory. Yeah. So there's countably many machines, but you can calculate uncountably many things because you have so many Oracle. Pardon? So there's countably many machines, but there you can still compute uncountably many different things. Exactly, exactly. So that many point, so countably many machines. So the machines, if we, if we, we with the empty hardware slot, okay, we look at this list, we have a list of all these machines with empty hardware slot, right? So the programs are completely determined. And then of course, what the machine will actually compute depends what we, what we put in the Oracle. What set we put in your so yes of course uh, and he says we take any subset if we plug the characteristic function of that into the into the oracle slot uh, the machine can certainly compute that set okay so Turing reducibility and Turing degrees so Terminology is a set A is Turing reducible to a set B. If means there's an or well, if there's an Oracle Turing machine which, given the Oracle for B, computes A. All this means is that if you have total information about B, then you can compute A. And that relation is certainly reflexive and transitive. And two sets are computationally equivalent or Turing equivalent if each is, compu is computable from the other. And a Turing degree is the collection of sets of all sets B, which are, which are computationally equivalent to A. There are two quote obvious Turing degrees. Zero, the degree of computable sets. Zero prime, the degree of the halting problem, which is not equal to zero by Turing's basic theorem. So the halting problem is not computable. And then, of course, a Turing degree contains only countably many sets since there are only countably many Oracle machines.
And they're, so they're uncountably, of course, they're uncountably many Turing degrees. Uh, relativization. Now, a basic fact of computability theory is classic results relativize. Because Turing machines formalize the total set of computational resources which we have. Now, Turing's classical theorem is the halting, of course, the unsolvability of the halting problem. Written out precisely, that means the halting problem for Turing machines is not computable by a Turing machine. Now, in the same way, if you have, we have computable by a Turing machine with the oracle for a given set A, this completely formalizes a total computational resource. So if you replace the words Turing machine in Turing's theorem, this is looked at a written, thinking of a written proof of Turing's theorem, replace Turing machine by words computable by a Turing machine with an oracle for A. Not only is the statement of the theorem correct, the proof is completely correct as written. Okay, so it relativizes, meaning the result doesn't depend on what the particular oracle is. We could have used, we could be talking about uh, computation with respect to any oracle whatsoever. The proof would be exactly the same. Uh, this is a side which I, I can't resist mentioning. Of course, P and A, the complexity classes P and NP are classes with restricted computational resources. So, of course, this makes sense by, by applying uh, this relative in Oracle. P sub A would denote the class of decision problems computable in polynomial time with by machines with an oracle for A, NPA, et cetera, et cetera. But the baker gill solovey theorem shows that whether or not PA equals NPA does not relativize. So this is of interest in computability, in the complexity theory, even of course for very, for very computable A. So what, what, whether whether equal or not depends on, they're equal for some A and different for some Bs. Now, we can, can, what we really want to do is consider coarse computability at densities less than one. So, Hirschfeld, Jockers, McCool, McNichol, and I introduce these following definition. What we really want to do is consider how arbitrary sets are approximated by computable sets. So, a set's computably, it's coarsely computable density R if you have a computable set C. So it's a lower density of symmetric degree when A and C is at least R. So this means C is at least R good, as an, at least an R good approximation of this set A. That the set is coarsely computable means it's coarsely computable at density one. But using, using the, uh, this definition, we can define the coarse computability bound ga gamma so gamma of a set is the soup of the, of the R such that A is coarsely computable at density R. So what this does is to assign a measure of computability to every subset of N. Namely, how, cl how closely can computable sets agree with A? Of course, gamma of A, since we're looking, this is defined in terms of density, gamma of A depends only on the similarity class of A. So it's also defined, defined on similarity classes both. But that, what does gamma of A equal one means that A is a limit of computable sets in the metric. Okay. So what we really what we really want to do is look at a limit of computable sets. This is very different from being coarsely computable. We already mentioned these, these sets uh, I n are so useful we we'll make a script operator I of I of script I, I of A is a union N and A of I sub N. So we take the one bit of information about whether or not N is an A and spread it over this very large interval. And the lemma is if gamma of I of A is bigger than half, then A has to be computable. And the idea of the proof is simply majority vote. So, the hypothesis is, is exactly is that there's this computable set C, such that the lower density of C and 
the, sym the symmetric agreement of C and I of A is bigger than a half. So you let, let a, I prime be the set of n such that more than half of the elements of I n are in C. So A prime is computable because C is computable. Certainly all the, all the I's are, I n's are computable. Now these are these, I n's are spreading out so fast you have to check that if A prime differed from A are infinitely many elements. This means it's, uh, the it's supposed to agreement is supposed to be bigger than half, but it's less than or equal to half on infinitely many of these very large intervals. I n, uh, that's a contradiction. So there are only finitely many errors in I prime. So if we correct those, that means that, that uh, A is computable. And we don't want, we know what they are, but they're only finite many. Of course, we can correct them. They correct those errors at the first thing, and then. Uh, Anush has a frown. Here's another bunch of sets that are really useful. The RKs. RK is a set of M such that 2 to the K divides M and 2 to the K plus 1 does not. So R0 is a set of odd non-negative integers. That's about my speed on Thursday afternoon. The density of, R, of any RK is one over two to the K plus one. And so the, of course these sets form a partition of N minus zero. And they, these are so useful, we'll make these an operator too. R of A is a union N and A of RN. The, so again, we're taking this, taking the information about one bit, whether it's an A or not, and spreading this, this time over an infinite set, but this, uh, this is, these are very different from the I, I construction. Okay, so we use these sets, these sets are useful for many purposes. In particular, the lemma is if gamma of R of A is one, is, is, is actually equal to one for every A. Doesn't matter what A is. As non-computable as possible. Okay, so we're looking at a limit. So for each fixed k, we have certainly have the following algorithm. We can use the finite list of, of which i less than or equal to k are in a. So we answer correctly on the, the union of uh, from i is zero to k of the r i. We answer yes, if something's in, in an r l with it, where r l is bigger. So this, this particular algorithm is correct with density at least what that's certainly computable computable set. This is uh, algorithms correct with the density at least one minus one over two to the k plus one. So we can get a set, some a computable set agreeing as closely as we like with R of A, so gamma of R of A is one. Okay, so, oh, oh, so, yeah. so uh, approximable sets are just the closure of all of the computable sets, like, right? You, in your, you, you have this countable family, uh, and you take the closure in your space, the closure of uh, computable sets. Computable sets, the closure, just the computer, exactly. Closure of computable sets contains all the, all the RAs. Right, uh, right, and to, yeah, okay. Lots of others, lots of other stuff too, of course. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to start as want to look at closures. Mm -hmm. It's not what we want in the general idea of what we want to look at. So of course, if it, if we have a Turing any Turing degree, we can relativize these definitions to to the tour, arbitrary Turing degree d. A is coarsely decomputable again if there's a set. C computable from D such the uh, lower density of density. Now, there's another misprint. The true mystery of mathematics. Now, these slides I've gone over so many times can still have misprint. The lower density of symmetric agreement of A and C uh, is, is one. No, so sorry, the density. This is coarsely computable. It's coarsely computable. It has a coarse description, which is computable. No, no, that was right. 
Now we would define the coarsely decomputable density R. It's the same thing. Uh, there's an R description B of A, such which is computable, which is computable from D. And again, of course, these de definitions depend only on similarity classes, so we can consider them defined on classes. And this is the same thing as gamma. We just put a subsoup D on it. It would be the soup of the R, such that R is decom coarsely decomputable at density R. So the point is, gamma D measures how closely arbit arbitrary sets can be approximated by sets computable for D. Of course, if a is coarsely decomputable and gamma D is one, but again, the, the converse is, of course, fails for all three. As we've just seen, R of A is even a limit of computable sets, so it's certainly a limit of sets computable from any degree whatsoever. Ah. Yes. Okay. Ah. For any Turing degree D, there are sets A with gamma sub D of A equals zero. There's a standard condition one can encant over this, but I think this is intuitively obvious. We fixed, we fixed uh, some set capital D of this degree, and there's things so far away from it, you, you can't compute anything. D can't compute anything about it. And the theorem... Didn't, didn't, you, didn't you prove that the uh, space is like highly not separable, any countable family, there is like a one that is far from it? And that's, that's, that's the guy, right? Uh, yeah. You see. Uh, let's see. Is this... Oh well, in essence, yeah. So the theorem is: if you take any 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 r in the unit interval that's set b with gamma sub d of b equals to r, and in the original proof, just in the in the context of computability, d is a, we're talking about computable. This is a page. It's not that hard, but it's a it's a at least a full page of real computability theory construction. So the point is, I claim in, in our context, this is totally obvious. Because we just take a path from the empty set to A where gamma D is uh, zero, gamma sub D is continuous. So there has to be a point V on A with gamma D of B equals R by the intermediate value theorem. This is what we would like to see more of, <laughs> is using, using these ideas, using ideas about the space to prove uh, computability theory results. On one hand, we say these proofs, these proofs are, not, are, are really not bad. The, the, these proofs of the properties of S are, uh, are easy because these, the, all these computability constructions were, were already there from course computability. So what's the point of that proof is that for, for zero itself, gamma D is always equal to one, right? Yeah, of course, the, the, the empty set, anything computes the empty set. Okay. And in this theorem, the quantifier on D is that it can be any Turing DVD, right? Yeah, it's any degree. Okay. That's right. So the proof, I mean, the computability proof of, of the theorem would of course, rel would of course relativize, but, this is, this is much simpler. I mean, we see it by elementary calculus. So the core, capital D is a collection of, pla of, of classes A such that D, A is computable from D, or if you like, it's, it's everything is, if you, if you think of just the sets instead of, of uh, classes, it's just everything is coarsely computable from D. Now it's clear that cores are countable since D computes only countably many sets. And just note that the, these, these completely determine the corresponding Turing degree. If D and E are degrees, then D is less than or equal to, Turing less than or equal to E, if and only if the cap of D is contained in cap of D. So now, of course, what do we want to consider? We consider the closure, d bar of d, which uh, is the, the, the closure of cap of d in the metric space S. So exactly, this is exactly the set of points, which are classes which are limits of points which are decomputable. 
So those IE that has to be just with computability, the class is A, A with gamma sub D of A equals one. Now, in contrast to cores, of course, the closure of, of everything is uncountable. In fact, we've seen that the arbitrary sets R of A or even limits of computable sets. So they're all in, in the closure of every degree. But uh, here's, a, oh, an observation, yeah. The core is a sub, of any degree is a subgroup. Of course, say if we can compute A and B, we can compute their symmetric difference. So closures of degrees are also subgroups since the closure of course, of course of, of any subgroup in the topological group is again a subgroup. I'm sure there are use, uses of this. We haven't, found, we haven't actually used this yet, but uh, it's sitting there. Closures also determine degrees. We've actually seen this already. In one sense, we've actually seen this from this uh, gamma of I of A construction. But in particular, if, if D and E are Turing degrees with D not reducible to E, then there are uh, continually many uh, similarity classes which belong to the closure of D, but not the closure of B. So, but in particular, D is less than re is reducible to E if and only if D closure is contained in E closure. So, so why is delta the correct metric to study Turing degrees? Well, since that's the metric space, we take the usual definition of a distance from a point to a subset. Uh, the distance from A to U it, to a subset U of S is the inf of the, of the delta from A to A to B with B and U. And either it sets, either it sets or classes in A. Sets in the pseudometric classes in the metric. Now, there's a very definite, natural de definition of the computational distance between the set and the closure of a, of a Turing degree, namely the computational distance from A to D closure is one minus gamma D of A. Because that's what exactly gamma D of what's the closure? It's exactly those things with gamma D equals to A. And pr from the basic lemma, yeah. If we will, I check this very carefully. The basic lemma shows that uh, yeah, the computational distance is equal to the metric distance uh, in term on distances from points to closures of degrees. So, uh, if we recall the definition of Hausdorff distance between subsets is the Hausdorff distance between two subsets of this metric space is the max. We take the, the soup of the distances from X and U to V and the soup of the distances Y, y and V from points of U and we take the maximum of in general, of course these are, this is not symmetric, those two different distances are different. And we, do, ah, Here's another property, which I'll come back to. We do not have the Sandra situation, but because the metric is bounded, the following is true. The space K of S, because they're all closed non-empty subsets of S is a complete metric space under the Hausdorff metric. Uh, the, quote, the standard theorem you take the compact, compact subsets of a complete metric space, but uh, the compactness is actually, they're used only to, uh, to get the distances bounded, because in the main, in, in that theorem, you're thinking of uh, spaces where the value of the metric is not bounded. So because it's the, all distances are bounded, in this case, are bounded by one, uh, this, results, this result holds. So how can we resist? We do, defining the Hausdorff distance between two Turing degrees as the Hausdorff distance between their closures in the space set. So notice I wrote definition one. We'll, we'll see, there's a purely computational definition of a computability definition of this, which is, which is equivalent. But th this was really sugge first suggested by looking, looking at the closure, looking at closures in this space. 
in, okay. Now we can actually calculate many house door distances. So, Andrews Kai Diamond Stone Joshua should land. In a super paper introduced the following definition. The lower, of course, lower bound of a degree, it, capital, which we're writing capital gamma, is the mth of gamma of A, where A is computable from T. Oh, I should put a subscript. Uh, oh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, here of computability. I haven't, I haven't relativized this yet. So what would this do? So this measures the, how far away can set, sets computable from D be from computable sets? Can we necessarily, can, can necessarily compute something that's uh, at maximum distance one or not? So we can relativize this uh, definition, of course, to comparison with an arbitrary degree. And we've seen if D is any non-zero degree, then gamma of D it's less than, has to be less than or equal to a half. Because if we can compute A from D, you can certainly compute I of A. Since you can compute I of A from A, and we've seen if it's bigger than a half, then gamma would have to be computable. Now, Andrew Sky, Diamond Stone, Jack Schindler showed there are uncountably many degrees with gamma sub D equals a half. Uh, this, is, this is not obvious. No, this is obvious at all. So we know that gamma can be, have values. This is just plain gamma with respect to computability. It can have values zero, one, or a half. The gamma question was the question of whether or not there could be other, any other values of gamma. And this was settled by Benoit Monin, who proved that indeed if gamma of D is strictly less than a half, then gamma of D is zero. This is a deep theorem. No way, no way, no way is this obvious uh, in the slightest. Now the proof, the proof is very non-trivial. So the only possible values of gamma are indeed zero, one half, or one. Now, we can, of course, we relativize capital gamma to every degree. The subscript, capital gamma, just subscript both gamma by E. And uh, using the, so using the equivalence between metric and computational distances to closures, what we have is that the Hausdorff distance between two degrees is one minus the minimum of gamma D of E and gamma E of D. So Monin's theorem relativizes to actually relativizes to all pair of degrees, although this is, this is a rather delicate relativization. Fortunately, Carl is a master computability theorist. So the theorem, it, it, does, it is true that for any pair D and E of degrees, the, the Hausdorff distance is, is either zero, one half, or one. So, if we cut D the set of all Turing degrees, then D with, D with house, uh, Hausdorff metric H is a metric space. And you might note then the, that the, of course, is the map eta from D with degrees with Hausdorff distance into K of H with Hausdorff distance defined by eta of D equals D closure is an, is an iso isometric embedding. That's the first way, that was the first definition of uh, D closure. So part of the general uh, I, I, I think I think in general looking looking at limits of computable sets in, in, in all kinds of certainly in, in many in more sophisticated ways than this is uh, is, is very basic. So what do we know? What we know about D with this D with that strange Hausdorff metric? Many of the basic things we don't know. We don't, already don't know at all. So general question. So we have this metric space with three values: zero, one half, and one. General question might be: What finite metric spaces can be isometrically embedded in D? H. In particular, the simplest possible case of this is the midpoint problem. 
So three points, three points in a line. Do we have degrees D, E, and F, such the distance from D to E is a half, which is the distance from E to F, and the distance from D to F is, is what? Is the simplest possible three-point measure. We don't know. I think I'm a, I, I always feel the answer must certainly be yes. I think Carl thinks the, the answer is probably no. But uh, even the, even this very basic question is uh, is not obvious at all. Okay, so the conclusion of the talk the, the the moral of the talk is yeah we want to look at Turing degrees. Yeah, limits of limits of computable things in turn in some kind of way. Okay, thank you. No questions. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's thank Paul for the talk. Uh, all right. So now we are opening the floor to questions. If there are any questions to the speaker? Please feel free to ask. Uh, Paul, uh, yes. so in, you defined, uh, you say uh, you take this, uh, the, the set of all uh, closed subsets and you're saying in that Hausdorff matrix, because it's, the metric is bounded, it makes it a complete metric space. And that's the only place that compactness was used to have the metric bounded. But the compactness is like very essentially used to build the Cauchy limit, like, uh, the limit of a Cauchy sequence. You, in uh, that proof. You have to keep the you have to keep the distances bounded. Sure, I mean the limit is this topological limit. I understand, but yes, then how yes. do you prove that it's actually the limit, like in the Hausdorff metric? Like that proof he heavily uses the compactness of the sets. Yeah, no, you can you can use you can use absolute you can use, abs you can use absolutely convergence. Uh, you can use absolutely convergence of sequences in metric space. Maybe I'll ask you later. I don't see. Yeah, that. sure. I yeah, I'll, be, I'll be glad to discuss. Yeah, no, I didn't see. How, we didn't see how to do it. I f actually found the proof. This is a, a, in a paper by G. B. Price in the proceedings of the AMS in 1940. Okay. Didn't come up. No, with but it. but the point is, it's a different proof than than the one for compact sets. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? Can I make a comment? Uh, sure. Go ahead, Carl. Uh, well, I guess I should turn on my video here. Uh, on that, can you put the uh, open question back up, Paul? Yeah. Um, you said I thought the answer was no. And uh, that's perhaps a little strong. It's just I have no idea how to show the answer is yes. But it's a little bit of a leap to say that I think the answer is no. I'm, I'm uh, well, I thought, I thought you were leaning in that. I thought you were leaning in that. Direction. No, I have no, I have no idea how to prove, say the, um, prove the answer is yes. Uh, one thing, one hope might be, so again, we have, the, we have this, this embedding of course, into the large space of all the uh, closed subsets of S. So, no, but we again, we don't really under we don't understand the connection. We don't really don't understand the connection yet between these these distances and uh, you know. Yeah, maybe if I'll what just say one comment that uh, I mean, you you covered an incredible amount of material, but I'll just throw in one more comment here. Is that please, please the do. answer to this question? is no, then we completely understand the metric space of the degrees under the Hausdorff, met Hausdorff metric in a strong sense. If it's yeah. yes, then who knows? Then yeah, that's true. So it's, it's a very basic question. All right. Yeah, uh, I guess is, uh, one, one more comment is to, to going to the beginning of the talk that you said you haven't seen this metric, or at least you, it's not, not clear how people the people that have used it. So I haven't seen it in the context of the, the, this Cantor space that you're considering. I mean, Cantor space mode, uh, mode is equal installation. But, uh, you know, you can, it's certainly, if you take the space of all um, measurable subsets of the 
zero one interval with Lebesgue measure, and then you mod out by uh, symmetric difference being null. Yeah, so you sure. get the so-called measure algebra, and the, the 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 metric you're considering is like just measure of the symmetric difference. Yeah, exactly. It's in the Polish space, and it's a, you know people consider that space. Oh, so, yeah, you get this Polish exactly. I mean, it's such a natural idea that uh, let's say if I would say it must must have been the, must have, someone in the Polish school, you know, the beginnings of real point set topology must have must have considered this. I mean, you can't. Yeah, but no, but but uh, you know that density is a more delicate thing than Lebesgue measure because you get oh, yes. a highly non non separable space that is like yeah, and of know, course it's it's uh, not uh, it's not uh, countably additive. One of the reasons these R's are so are so useful, of course, because the, the tail the density of tails are usually are uniformly going to zero. Uh, if you take uh -huh. If you take either, if you take any subset, uh, any say, yeah, any sub subset, then the, the that the sum of the densities of the R n for that n actually uh, actually converges. So it's, it has a density, and it's the obvious density the sum sum of certain powers of one over powers of two. Mm -hmm. So in particular, that that shows that. Uh, well, it could be so simple. Every every uh, every number in the unit interval is a density of something. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that has, that has other uses that these densities add. All right. Very good. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Then let's thank Paul again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I, I also wanted to I mention, could put up I, I could put up a slide with some some bibliographical references. Uh, yeah. So uh, right. I hope that Paul will uh, provide us not today, then a little later with the slides. I'll post them online at the course. page. And I wanted to mention that uh, for last week's talk by uh, Alina Vdovina, both the, a copy of the slides uh, and a link to the video of your talk are already available. So. Uh, you can watch it there, and I'll try to post uh, a video of this talk later today. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that uh, uh, next week we have uh, Tatiana Smirnova Nagnibeda from Geneva, so she'll be speaking. Uh, I forgot the title of her talk, but uh, it's already posted uh, online in the, at the seminar page.